All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Having a good reInvent? Almost over, right? <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, my name's Trevor Dyke. I'm a product manager in AWS. I've been working with AWS's messaging and workflow services for the last uh, two and a half years or so. And joining me today here are Odd Waller, from, uh, who flew all the way here from Sweden uh, to talk about uh, Volvo and Wireless Car and what they're doing with messaging, and Emilia Sharma from GE Digital. So. Um, after I give my introduction about the product, they're going to talk a little bit about what they're doing with messaging and, um, and uh, just how they see the, the future of messaging going with, with services like Amazon MQ. So um, why are we here? Hopefully you're here to talk about messaging. Anyone not here to talk about, hear about messaging? Okay, you're all in the right place, good. So um, as, as most of you know, I think if you're involved with messaging, it's been around a long time. It's been around almost as long as computing itself. Um, it's what allows different software systems written in different languages, on different operating systems and platforms in different locations uh, to communicate and exchange information. Um, you may not know this, but SQS was actually the first AWS service. It was launched in 2004. Um, I was talking to Jeff Barr one day, and he wrote the initial blog announcing SQS, and, and people were saying, why is a bookstore launching a queue? <laughs> and you know, here we are today, um, a few years later, with you know, 40,000 plus people at a conference about web services. So, so it was the start of, of something big. Um, and so just like compute and storage, messaging is really a fundamental building block of enterprise applications. Um, as an example, Amazon.com's uh, retail uh, e-commerce platform relies on SQS and SNS. You may not have known that. So every retail order goes through SQS and SNS. So they scale massively. Uh, the last Prime Day, SQS supported or uh, trans transmitted uh, over 40 billion messages in a single day and up to 10 million transactions per second peaking. And I just heard that it was a little bit higher uh, on Black Friday last week. I don't have the final numbers yet. Um, but you know, SQS and SNS were built for applications that are born in the cloud. That's why they're, they're very simple and they're really scalable. They're just built to scale massively to handle situations like I just told you about with, with, uh, with Amazon retail's business, retail business. Um, but if you want to use existing systems um, that are based on industry standards, you have to rewrite a lot of your applications. And, what you guys told us, you know, when I was working on SQS and SNS, what I'd hear over and over again is they're great systems, but I have to rewrite messaging code that's in existing applications. And that's a lot of work, it's a lot of investment. I don't want to do that. Um, and many of you said you're already using systems like IBM MQ, um, TIBCO EMS, Oracle WebLogic, or the open source systems like ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ. And these things have, have something in common. They have uh, common APIs. The other thing you guys told us is that the standard-based messaging systems that you're using today are time-consuming and costly to manage. The word that we kept hearing from you was painful. We kept hearing it's just painful to manage this stuff. Setting up a message broker requires procuring, install, installing and configuring new hardware, as well as architecting your system for failure. This is why some of our customers moved their message brokers to EC2 rather than provisioning their own infrastructure. But you're still stuck with managing the message broker. Dealing with software and security setup and ongoing upgrades adds a lot of operational overhead and really no business value. And commercial brokers, if you're using them, they have the added overhead of expensive licensing commitments uh, and maintenance. But mission critical apps, they rely on messaging. So constantly mess messing with these systems and maintaining uptime can also be scary. So on Tuesday, we launched a new service, Amazon MQ. How many of you heard about it or, or saw the announcement? Great. Um, I assume you did. That's why you're here today. <laughs> um, and it's a new service we built for you that gives you messaging compatibility without the overhead. Very simply, it's a managed message broker service for Apache ActiveMQ that makes it easy to set up and operate message brokers in the cloud. Some of our customers said, it's really just like RDS for ActiveMQ, and that's really actually quite a good analogy. So what does it do? It automates those time-consuming tasks that you told us are painful. So things like provisioning new message brokers, uh, providing software updates, managing security, patches for security, 
Um, other maintenance tasks such as software upgrades, uh, monitoring the health of your broker, making sure that the infrastructure underneath it is working correctly and that the broker itself is healthy, and troubleshooting. So, you know, AWS will take care of troubleshooting issues for you rather than your teams having to do that, that extra work. So we talked about what drove us to build this for you, and you told us you wanted API compatibility because you didn't want to rewrite a lot of code. And that makes it easier for you to migrate what you have already today, and it provides interoperability. So you're not locked into this system. You can move to another system that provides the same API compatibility if, you're, if you don't like it, if you're unhappy with it. So we looked at what was out there when we said we want to build something with API compatibility, and we really looked hard, and we, we looked at ActiveMQ, and we said, ActiveMQ, and customers told us ActiveMQ provides the broadest API compatibility. A lot of our customers are already using it and running it on EC2. Um, it's a great open source product. It's got an active community, and it's compatible with those industry standard APIs that we're talking about. Uh, JMS being a very important one, Java Message Service, Java Message Service uh, which is the native API for most uh, messaging systems out there today. There's also NMS, which is for those, those .NET apps out there. It's a .NET variant of, of JMS. And then there's a kind of a new kit on the block you might have heard of called AMQP, which is the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. It was recently ratified as an ISO standard, and it actually is a wire level protocol that provides uh, compatibility between messaging systems at the wire level. So it's gaining popularity. We're seeing a lot of interest in AMQP. And it also includes some really nice protocols like MQTT. Um, Amui is going to talk a bit about that. Um, it's popular in the IoT space, as well as Stomp, a text protocol, and WebSocket. So it's got a lot of uh, protocols and APIs that are fairly standard and will help you uh, if you want to move to a managed service. So you have a, a nice choice there. Of course, um, you guys also told us you can't lose our messages. Many of you are running mission-critical systems on, on these messaging systems. So we really looked at how are we going to architect this for high availability and high durability. So we built Amazon MQ to automatically provision the broker for high availability and durability. So we have an active standby model, as you see in the, in the slide there, um, across availability zones. So as you know, availability zones are geographically separate zones. So in the case of an issue with a broker or even a full availability zone outage, um, the standby takes over. There's no message loss. Uh, messages are stored in a replicated message store. It's very highly durable, and it's replicated across availability zones. So if there is any kind of failure or issue with the broker with the, or even the availability zone, the standby takes over, and there's no message loss. Um, so that's, those are, you know, that's for production instances. Um, and like RDS does, we also offer single instances, which are um, just a single instance and a single AZ, and that's really more useful for development and test scenarios. When you're not in production, you don't need that active standby, but you just want to try it out or evaluate, or maybe you just want to do some testing. So that's, uh, that's also available. You guys also told us that it has to be secure. You, want, you wanted, uh, we heard, worry-free security. So we designed it for the security enterprises need. Um, your data is encrypted both in transit and at rest. It's uh, encrypted in transit using, using TLS. Uh, you can also choose to have your data persisted to an encrypted message store. So the message store, if you persist to the message store, um, ActiveMQ has both the non-persisted and persisted mode. But if you, if you persist that data, it'll be stored to an encrypted uh, data store. It's fully integrated as well with uh, Amazon VPC. Uh, so you have uh, VPC endpoints to the broker by default. Um, of course, you can also have a public endpoint if that's something you want to do, but it's, it's optional. You can just uh, have it available only within your VPC, and that's actually the default mode. Um, and then security groups provide further guards against unwanted access. So security groups are like a, a virtual firewall. Many of you are, are already using AWS. You're familiar with security groups on, on EC2 and RDS. Very similar. Um, it's a virtual firewall. You can control what traffic is allowed inbound and outbound from uh, you know, IP address and, and port perspective. When we talked to you guys, you also told us uh, ActiveMQ is great, but it lacks some monitoring capabilities. Many of you have had to, if you're using one of these brokers, you've had to build your own monitoring capabilities or use another third-party tool. So what we did is we integrated it with Amazon CloudWatch metrics. So you can monitor the health of your broker. 
Uh, you can monitor things like CPU, memory utilization, just to monitor the broker itself. But you can also monitor metrics on queues and topics themselves, like the depth of a queue, so you can, um, you, know, you can see if there's issues with messages getting through. You can set alarms uh, to, to alarm you, to notify you through SNS or, or something like that, to tell you if, um, if you're having an issue with your broker. You can also use um, auto-scaling. So you can set up um, auto-scaling to scale on the depth of a queue. So you can actually have your consumer fleet scale out horizontally. And, and many of you, if you're using SQS, you do this already. You can scale out your consumer fleet as your queue is getting deeper to make sure you're, you're processing those messages. Um, and we haven't talked much about activating the queue itself, but it's a very rich message broker with a, a, a very active open source community. Um, and if you're going to move to managed service and if you're moving off another broker, there's a lot of features you need, especially some of these older enterprise systems that um, are using some of these legacy message brokers. A lot of them are using things like um, transaction, local transaction capability or distributed transactions with the XA protocol. Um, so those are the kind of complex features that, you know, they don't exist in something simple like SQS because it's, it's built for a different purpose. It's built to be really scalable. So, but ActiveMQ supports those kind of features, so it makes it possible for you to move, move to that from if, if you're using some other, um, you know, message broker. Um, in addition to the persistent messaging I talked about earlier, um, some of you told us you really want to crank up the performance in some applications, and you actually don't care about the high availability or the durability of those messages. It's okay to lose messages; you just care about performance. So, ActiveMQ also supports uh, transient messaging. Um, so the messages actually just stay in memory. Uh, in that case, if there's a failover, you'll, you'll lose those messages, but you can really get much higher throughput. Um, of course, all the basics are supported, like queues and topics uh, with ordered messaging, once-only delivery, so those kind of table stakes are there. Um, and some of you are, are using, some of, of your uh, current systems have really large messages, sometimes megabytes or, or even larger. Um, ActiveMQ doesn't have any limitation on message sizes, uh, which is nice. Uh, and we don't, we're not going to restrict your message retention. So if you, if you want to keep those messages around for a long time, you can keep those, keep those in, the, in your queues. We're not going to expire those messages. So, and there's one other thing that's really cool. I love this feature. If you're already using ActiveMQ, you can just import your existing XML file. So ActiveMQ, for those of you who are familiar with it, it uses a spring-based XML configuration file. So the, the way we built this is you just actually import that file. There's a few things that, uh, that we manage, so we'll strip those out. For example, the, the message store, we manage that for you, so we won't let you configure that. And there's other things that we won't, we, we won't let you configure because we're going to manage it. Um, but everything else, you just, it just imports it, and then uh, it'll work just as, as you had it previously. So it makes it much quicker uh, to migrate if you're using ActiveMQ already. And you know, last but not least, you guys told us you know, enterprise messaging today, it's really expensive for you. Um, licensing, maintenance, renewals, potentially every year, as well as all the underlying infrastructure. So we're making the cost much more manageable. Like most other AWS services, you only pay for what you use. There's no upfront costs. There's no licensing, no fees. You just pay by the hour. You can get started free for the first year. Uh, for the first year, you can use uh, we have two instance sizes, MQ, T2, Micro, we call it, and uh, MQ.M4 uh, MQ Large. So the T2 Micro, you can use it for free for the first year for up to 750 hours a month, which if you do the math, 750 hours is basically running at 24 hours a day uh, for a month. And, uh, and you get one gig of storage as well for the first year. After that, it's only 30 cents per hour for a single instance. So if you're running an active standby pair, it's 60 cents per hour. Uh, this is US pricing. It's a little bit different in, in different regions. And storage is 30 cents per gigabyte month. OK, so why don't we see a little bit of a demo and see, see what I've actually been talking about here. Let me just switch. Give me a moment here, sorry. There we go. OK, so this is uh, the first page you'll see when you go to the console for Amazon MQ. And you can see just in the top right there, it says create a broker. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to show you 
creating a broker. You'll see how quick and easy that is. I'm going to send some, create a queue. I'm going to send some messages. And then we're going to actually do a failover. And then I'll show you in CloudWatch how, how that failover looks. So let's create a broker called My Broker, My Broker 1. As you can see, there's two instance sizes there. There's the micro and the large. So for this demo, we're going to pick a large instance size. And then there's the choice of deployment mode. So like I said, there's a single broker deployment or the active standby deployment for high availability. So we're going we're gonna to show HA. So let's, uh, let's pick active standby. And then for access to the ActiveMQ web console, we need a username and password. So we'll, we'll set up a username and password there. And now you can see my, my broker creation is in progress. So that's going to take about five to 10 minutes to, uh, to create that broker, uh, depending. Um, but you know, like, like the, uh, the baking shows, you see where the cake's already in the oven and you just pull it out uh, while, you're, while you're baking the first one. Um, I've already got a broker ready here. So let's take a look at this broker that's already created, broker one. Same configuration that I just, just created. And so now we can see some details of the broker. So you can see the, uh, the ARN, the resource uh, name, some specifications, you know, what size the broker is, what mode it's configured in. Uh, you can see the security network settings, so you can see what the VPC is, the subnets. And here you can see all the endpoints that we support, so for the various protocols that I mentioned, AMQP and Stomp. So those are what you wire up to your code. And then here's the uh, ActiveMQ console URL. So you see two URLs there, one for each console. One's the active, one's the standby. So let's, let's look at the uh, active broker here. So it's just standard ActiveMQ, open source version. If I look at the other one, I get a site unavailable. That's because that's sitting in standby mode. It's actually not running. So let's go back to the, to the active uh, broker here. And I'm going to click on Manage. So I'm going to enter the admin, uh, the, uh, sorry, the username and password admin and, and the password, which I'm not going to tell you uh, right now. And now we see ActiveMQ. So I'm logged into ActiveMQ, uh, broker one. And what I'm going to do here is uh, just something simple. Let's create a queue, and we're going to send a few messages on this queue. So there's my queue. And I'm going to click Send here. And there's that checkbox that I mentioned, persistent delivery. So we can pick persistent delivery. This can be pick configured at a global level, or you can configure it sort of on a per message level. So I'm not going to send these as persistent. So I'm just going to type a message here, hello, reInvent. And I'm going to send 100 messages. And these are going to be non-persisted. OK, so now we've got 100 messages sitting there in that queue. Now let's send some more messages. Let's turn on persistent delivery. And we'll send 100. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. Hello again. OK, let's send those messages. And now we've got uh, 200 messages sitting here in this queue. OK, so now let's make it a little more interesting. Um, let's, let's initiate a failover. So those messages are sitting in our queue. And let's, let's pretend that there's an issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to reboot this broker. So what's going to happen is it's going to actually fail over to the standby instance. And then it's going to come back to the active instance. So, and you'll see that in a moment in the CloudWatch metrics. So, OK, so we've initiated a reboot. So it says here reboot takes about five minutes. So reboot in progress. So we go back to that broker that we were looking at. We'll click refresh a couple times here. And in a moment, you'll see it go offline. OK, it's gone offline. And let's go look and see if our standby is up. OK, now our standby is taken over. So back to the same console. It's going to have the same configuration. Enter a username and password again. Here we are. And let's take a look. Here's our queue. Uh, 100 messages in the queue, not 200. How come? Well, we sent 200. We sent 100 non-persistent and 100 persistent. So the persistent ones stayed in the queue. Non-persistent are gone. So that's just to show you that, you know, how that works, and the non-persistent messages aren't saved. Okay. So now it's failed again, and uh, it's going back. It's going to go back to the active instance, the previously active one. And 
we see there there's actually only 100 messages there as well, because we lost those, those initial messages. OK, so, so that's kind of a basic demo of how the active standby works. Um, let's take a look at how this works in our CloudWatch metrics. So we click View CloudWatch Metrics, and this is a standard CloudWatch console. I've got broker metrics here, queue metrics, and topic metrics. So three categories of metrics. Let's take a look at the broker metrics. And we're going to look at total message count across uh, broker one and then broker two. So there's my broker one, there's my broker two. A chart appears. And the blue line is, is broker one, the orange is broker two. So let's uh, zoom in a bit more and increase our resolution. So now we got one minute. So one minute interval. So you can see broker one, we've got 200 messages. And then our broker two, briefly there, has 100 messages. And then you see the metrics showing broker one again with 100 messages. So that's just showing you how you see the metrics and how the failover works from a, uh, from a message count point of view. So that's, that's a very quick demo. Um, you can see how easy it is to create some brokers. You can see how the high availability works. You can see how easy it is to monitor metrics. So we're just trying to make things a lot easier for, for folks out there that want to create, uh, create and manage brokers, give access to their development team to do this without having to contact a, a central team and, and ask for, for a broker and those kinds of things. So um, I'm just going to flip back to the slides here. So some of you might ask, well, What's happening to SQS and SNS? When should I use those? Well, SQS and SNS are definitely not going away. They're super important services. We have tons of customers using them, as I mentioned, including Amazon itself. So what we recommend is SQS and SNS um, are ideal for brand new, kind of born in the cloud applications. And that's because they are simple. That's, that's their name, Simple Queue Service and Simple Notification Service. They have very simple APIs, easy to use, easy to get started. Uh, you don't need to learn anything very complex. They provide nearly unlimited throughput, and they're quite inexpensive. It's all paid per API request, so you know, 40 to 50 cents per, per API request. Amazon MQ um, is really it's ideal if you're migrating something that's existing, and you need that compatibility with APIs like JMS or AMQP. Uh, they're also more feature rich, so when you're migrating applications and you need those uh, more complex features, they're great for that. Um, and the other difference is, it's, as I talked about the pricing, it's paid per hour and per gigabyte. Uh, it's generally available today. Uh, actually, on Tuesday it was generally available. Um, it's in six regions right now, so definitely check it out. Uh, it's in the regions shown here, Virginia, Ohio, Oregon, uh, two regions in Europe, and one region in Asia Pacific. We'll be rolling it out in more regions over the coming, uh, coming year or so, and we expect to roll it out globally. So. Um, definitely check it out. It's pretty easy to, to access the console and, and take a look. We've also uh, got some great launch partners we've been working with. Uh, Cedrus, uh, who I see here in the room, uh, Deloitte, uh, Slalom, and Trinimbus are all partners that are SIs that can help you if you want to do uh, migrations. Um, they have experience with messaging systems and can help you migrate. Uh, HashiCorp as well, I'll talk about them in a moment, has, has been a partner. So just as one example, um, Cedrus, they're a boutique consulting for, firm uh, based in New York. Uh, they were part of our beta program as we designed Amazon MQ. And they work a lot of, a lot of, with a lot of the uh, financial services and healthcare companies, uh, big enterprises that are running on systems like IBM MQ. And during the beta program uh, last month, actually, they were successfully able to migrate one of their customers' uh, applications to Amazon MQ, the JMS-based app, in about a day. So uh, I think that just is a good example of how easy it can be. Uh, we have another partner, uh, HashiCorp. Uh, may, many of you probably know HashiCorp. They make a great product called Terraform. Um, they worked with us uh, as we were building this product uh, to offer day zero support for Amazon MQ and Terraform. It's a tool developed uh, to man manage your infrastructure as code, so you can consist consistently create and manage uh, infrastructure. Um, so it's a really great product. It's supported today. You can actually go to their website and, and uh, download support for Amazon MQ. OK, so enough of me. Uh, now I'd like to introduce one of our customers to tell you about what they've been doing with messaging. Um, Odd Waller, welcome Odd Waller from Wireless Car. Uh, they've been a beta partner for Amazon MQ, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit to you about his, uh, their journey with messaging. So thanks, Odd. Thank you. 
So, yeah, my name's uh, Odd Waller. It's um, odd by name and odd by nature. It's <laughs> usually when I come to English-speaking countries, uh, <laughs> a little bit fun. So, wireless car is in the um, connected solution uh, uh, industry. And what does that mean? Well, we work um, uh, in the automotive industry and we connect vehicles. We roughly have around 2 million vehicles in 50 regions around the world connected. As you can see on this uh, picture here, we follow the vehicle throughout its um, lifespan. It starts, um, typically these are high-end high high -end vehicles. So from when they actually leave the factory, they're, they're already connected. Uh, we follow them through the, um, uh, through the, from the factory to the um, dealers. They sometimes have a tendency to disappear there, so that's why, it's, <laughs> why it needs to be done. And once, once they're actually there, uh, <clears throat> the dealers can, can uh, easy enough show to the uh, car manufacturer that they have the car and that it's uh, with them. So what else do we do? What, what, what does co consumer see? So uh, we have we have various amount of, um, uh, of services that we offer. So once I'm from Sweden, it's really cold, <laughs> it's wet and it's dark. So uh, I like to turn on my heater before I go to the car. So when I come out, it's warm, cozy, I don't have to scrape the windows. Here we probably turn on the air, con uh, air conditioning instead. Um, other things uh, is just find my car, uh, for instance. Uh, some of our car manufacturers team up with uh, online stores, like grocery stores. Uh, you go online, you order your groceries, uh, you select in-car delivery, the, um, uh, the grocery store drives the groceries to your car, they get the one-time code, they put it in your trunk, and once you go home, you have your, you have your groceries. And the uh, code can only be used once. Um, so those are, those are the stuff that uh, you see from, uh, from a consumer based, uh, basically. Then you have your business case, uh, fleet management system, we have car sharing, uh, where they need to see where, it, where are the cars, how much gas is in the car, who drove it last, how did he drive or she, uh, the car, uh, and so on. Driver statistics and uh, all sorts of things. Then we come to our critical things, which is basically stolen vehicle tracking. If the vehicle gets stolen, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to show for um, first responders where, where are the vehicle, where can you find it, can you uh, hit it up in transit. Once, once we start the stolen vehicle tracking, it sends a lot of data back and forth constantly. And then uh, what we call emergency call, e-call, if the car crashes. Uh, you have OnStar here, um, uh, we don't have that in, in, in Europe, for instance, but um, basically if the airbags explode, uh, voice comes up in, um, in the car, talks to you, sees everything is okay, sends the first responders there. So why am I uh, talking about all this? Well, all of our, uh, all of our critical uh, services use, uh, use messaging. Uh, our oldest solution is uh, 12 plus years, so it's been around for quite some time. Uh, it's uh, currently a hybrid um, with uh, some parts in AWS and in some parts on-prem. Uh, we're slowly moving to a, a microservice uh, architecture, but it, it takes time. It's an old system. It's been it's been just growing. <laughs> so, um, but what we have uh, right now is uh, uh, an internal uh, messaging infrastructure in Americas, Europe, and APAC uh, on-prem, and we have the same thing uh, in AWS, and they communicate in, uh, with each other. They also communicate back to uh, our owner, uh, which, is, which are running uh, IBM um, WebSphere MQ. Um, uh, where was I? Yes, so uh, that handles all the internal um, uh, messaging. Then we have for each solution, we have dedicated uh, um, 
dedicated uh, instances set up. Uh, they can be uh, uh, different number of nodes and, 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 and clusters and so on. But basically, what, what, what's specific about these are that, of, of course, not all of our solutions are 12 plus years, so they, they've been coming along. Uh, so we have a vi wide variety of different uh, message brokers. So we have uh, JM, we have all. <laughs> we have, uh, but the, the big ones are JMS, uh, Red Hat AMQ, um, Active MQ, uh, and they, that it works fine, but it's still, uh, it's still different. It needs to be maintained. Um, these dedicated systems also talk to the external systems. It talks to the car manufacturer, sends uh, the information there. It also uh, talks to other third-party um, suppliers, such as that might deliver different things uh, inside the car. The, the, the thing is really today, today, if you buy a car today, it's not the same as when you bought a car 10 years ago. If you buy a car 10 years ago, it was fine. You bought the car, and two years later, you, you sold it. You didn't expect it to change in any way unless you actually brought it into the shop. Today, if you buy a car and uh, your neighbor buys the same car just one model year later, and he has a better uh, media player or some extra functionality, you expect that to be available for your car. That's the pressure that the uh, that the car manufacturers have on uh, them today, that it should, it should live and breathe, it should, it, should, um, it should add features all the time. So naturally we get that pressure as well <laughs> to make sure that they can deliver these. Um, so while messaging is core to our application, it, it, it really is, I mean, it's, without messaging, our applications don't work. Uh, and Things like emergency call, that can't stop working. I mean, we're talking with lives at stake then. So, but today, being uh, hybrid, we have to uh, sometimes, um, or not sometimes, we have, we have to make compromises on, uh, on how, we, uh, how we set up the infrastructure for it to be, uh, to be manageable. Uh, we have to spend time in automating the infrastructure uh, and have to make sure that the uh, on-prem solutions and the um, cloud-based solutions are the same. Um, for us, that adds, that adds no value uh, whatsoever. I mean, uh, if, we could, uh, if we could get rid of that, that's, that's perfect. Um, see, seeing how, how we will quickly, more quickly being able to switch out the messaging part this will help us in our journey to quickly, more quickly move up. Um, so another thing which is really important for us is uh, the design. Uh, we want to be able to tailor the design for each of our solutions. We don't want to have the same design for, uh, for different solutions. Uh, sorry, we do want to have uh, uh, different designs for different solutions. Uh, and especially because we're integrating with other third parties, we want to have uh, it optimized on that. And right now, uh, we spend a lot of time in uh, doing automation and setting it up and, and being, making sure that we can do managing it uh, in an easy way. Um, so the design we've noticed can, can really be better. The next thing is resources. Uh, Messaging kind of falls in between a little bit, at least um, <laughs> for the people that I interview. So we have, this, we have the system admin and we have the developers, but the, the, the specialists on, on messaging are really hard to come by, and they know that they are hard to come by, so they're, they're, they're expensive. Um, but um, with, with this, uh, so what we do now typically is that it's, it's the sysadmins that sets everything up. And it takes time, and it, uh, it, um, it's just it's not effective. So if we can, uh, and that brings us to the last point, if we can actually get the uh, developers to do it uh, quickly, they don't have to wait to get something uh, uh, installed or ordered. It will just uh, be there from, uh, from the start. And they can test, and they can 
fail much faster, and then they can be right in the end. So well, what we're hoping uh, and, and what we're seeing is uh, now that we've, we've actually been able to uh, create specifically designed um, solutions for our customers. We've been able to do it uh, pretty fast. And, um, and we've been able to keep the business uh, or the, keep the focus. So we don't have to um, spend a lot of time in how, what kernel parameters should be for the messaging system. Where, where, where do we need to put that? How, what sort of disks and so on. So for us, it's been, uh, it's been a, a tremendous help. You still need to configure it and everything, but you can focus on the right things. So um, yeah, we're, we're happy so far. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much, and uh, off to you, Trevor. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rod. That's super interesting. Um, I'm excited to see all these cool features you guys bring to our cars. I really actually want to try that grocery delivery to my <laughs> truck. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, try that one. Just don't try the uh, automatic crash notification. That's yeah, good to try. <laughs> I don't want the automatic <laughs> crash notification. No, thanks. Cool. So um, now let's talk about GE. Uh, GE has really transformed into a digital company and, and have embraced AWS. You've probably heard about GE at various reinvents if you've been here before or maybe even this year. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you uh, Amulya Sharma uh, to tell you what GE is up to. Well, welcome, Amulya. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Uh, so I'm standing between you and this awesome replay party. So don't look at me like this. I'll try to finish as soon as possible. <laughs> and then we all head to this awesome replay party. Uh, how are you guys doing? Still awake? <laughs> OK, let's get started. So um, uh, I am Amulya, Amulya Sharma from GE. Um, what we do at GE is basically GE is a digital industrial company, uh, all the way from big iron to big, big data, connecting machines to the cloud, sending all the data machines are generating to the cloud and sending action back to the machines. That's what we are aiming for. Uh, the, the, the reason why we need to do all of this is because customers these days don't ask that, hey, uh, I need an asset and I need a service plan on the asset. They ask deeper questions like, can, can I, how can I guarantee my asset is running at an optimal performance level through the asset lifecycle? How can I avoid unplanned uh, downtime? Uh, so in order to give these kind of uh, services and in order to give these features to the customer, the only way for, uh, to make all of this happen is co collect all the data from the asset and do some uh, edge uh, processing, but transfer it to the cloud and try to understand you know, what asset is running under, what kind of conditions assets are running under. Uh, and that is why um, we created a cloud which sits on top of Amazon uh, so we, uh, this is a little bit of our platform, just to give you the numbers and the scale of our platform. It's, right now we are running on four different uh, AWS regions. Uh, we have almost 33,000 developers developing industrial applications on it, tens of thousands of machines, uh, tens of thousands of applications, almost 300,000 assets under management. So this is a scale is pretty big because it's an industrial scale, right? So. Uh, now, why I was mentioning to you about our cloud is primarily because like that, I want to lead it to the messaging. So messaging is very important on our platform. And why it is important because of some of the use cases which messaging offers. So we have a service uh, on our platform called Predix Message Queues. It offers uh, the protocol like AMQP, MQTT, uh, it's built on an open source software, RabbitMQ, uh, and we manage currently 3,000 message broker in production environment. What we are seeing is that, and this is very uh, you know, interesting for you guys as well, there are uh, amazing use cases of these new protocol. I think Trevor mentioned about advanced message queue protocol as well. So there are use cases which uh, we are seeing, there are some with microservices and in IoT space. And all of these use cases are tied to the product which we are talking about, Amazon MQ, which offer these protocols, which offer the support for these protocols. Uh, AMQP support was not there at uh, AWS before. 
only after Amazon MQ launch, you have a managed AMQP support, so which is exciting. So let's dig a little bit deeper on these use cases. So more and more these days, applications are running in a microservices architecture model. And the, what, the challenge with the microservices architecture model is that there are too many applications. They talk a lot. They talk to each other, right? And if they all talk on HTTP, it creates some problem. It creates some problems like there's a lot of dependency, right? There's a lot of HTTP traffic flowing through, through your network. Uh, so microservices communication over AMQP is a very popular use case these days. What it will enable you to do, instead of like what is not possible with the HTTP, what it will let you do is, there are a few advantages which are listed here, and I'll go at quickly. The first is application decoupling. So you don't have to manage the clumsy SDK of HTTP. Like you don't have to give your clients, the client libraries, to call your service. They put the message on the AMQP uh, via AMQP, and you read the message via AMQP. The next is easy to change. I change without changing my SDK. I change my application, and my, uh, the, the other microservice doesn't need to change because I changed. Uh, you can do more uh, sophisticated orchestration behavior, like event-based processing within your microservices. This is, again, a very uh, key use case is emerging. The scalability is, uh, is amazing because uh, you can scale up uh, microservices A, without changing microservice B, or without even scaling up microservice B, because everything is on the message queue. There is a buffer, right? Uh, the last which I really liked is the resiliency, uh, because you, let's say your microservices took a dip. Microservice A is talking to microservice B. Microservice B took a dip, like it went down, it crashed. All of the nodes are crashed. Let's assume that scenario. Now, microservice A will not see the failure, because microservice A is still pushing the message to the queue. And microservice B will recover, meanwhile, in like less than a minute or 30 seconds, whatever the recovery time is, and start the processing from the same place where it crashed. So no uh, transaction loss. There is no degradation at microservice A because somebody else just crashed. So that's the, one of the key use cases with the MQP protocol. And with the introduction of Amazon MQ, there is a managed MQP uh, service in the cloud. The next key use case which we are seeing a lot in our uh, developer community and on our platform is Edge to Cloud. And when you talk about Edge to Cloud, it's challenging because uh, sometimes Edge is, when I say Edge, it's remote. Like sometimes Edge is at a location where the bandwidth is not good. Sometimes the energy is also a constant in that. You're running on the batteries, right, rather than a con continuous power supply. So the MQTT protocol comes very handy at that case. Uh, it is specifically designed for use cases where the energy, where the bandwidth and the energy has, has limited supply. So you run a, a small computer or is a kind of edge device on your uh, asset. In this case, it's a windmill. And its job is to push messages to the MQTT broker running in the cloud. Now, because of the MQTT nature, you are getting the benefit of low bandwidth, uh, low energy consumption footprint at the edge. Uh, and this MQTT broker, which can be Amazon MQ, is running the cloud, getting all your messages, and sending it to the app. An app is consuming from there. In this case, the producer is the edge, consumer is the app, and an app can store it to the, all the S3 or uh, Dynamo or whatever the data store you like to use. So that's another interesting use case which is emerging. You know, Edge to Cloud and MQTT is very handy in this. And uh, Amazon MQ supports MQTT as well. So that's exciting. The last is, so I've been running, uh, like, with, I can share my experience uh, of running a broker as a managed service, right? It is painful because nobody likes when the messages get lost. You know, you, it is, you really, really need to maintain the high availability, uh, the failover, the security, and all those things. So I'll share my experience, okay? What is like, how do you decide whether do it yourself? Like, should you manage your, whatever the broker you are using? Not Act ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, or IBM, or should you do it yourself, or you should go for the managed service? Like, let somebody else manage it for you. So here are the, some key points which you take away with you and like think about what you should do. 
First is installation. Installation is fairly simple, right? In today's world on Amazon, you can do yum install or you can do Docker run. You know, it's all work. It's all great. You know, it's very simple to install a software these days. But the minute you install, that's just day zero. You know, what about day one, day two, and day three? The second question comes is the availability. How do you make sure whatever you installed is always up and running, right? The third thing, the minute you start giving this to developers, uh, you know, a developer A will ask, hey, I need this configuration for my application. The developer B will gonna ask, I need some other configuration for my application. So how are you gonna build this feature set where you can give developers a self-service way of adding configuration to the broker? Like either you have to give access to the broker and things, so that brings more complexity. Backups and restore is again, you know, something which you need to engineer together with your service. Uh, integration with your existing monitoring and logging is a bigger, is another challenge. You need to manage the agents. You need to make sure you capture all the logs. Securing security is another key point because no matter on which uh, army you select. There will be vulnerabilities, like even you do Ubuntu, CentOS, and you need to recycle your army, you need to recycle your image. And in order to do that, you need to make sure you fail over and then all that in orchestrated fashion so that the production workload is not impacted. And then the version upgrades of the software itself. So even though you are super you know, good at uh, understanding the software which you are offering, there are other components which makes a managed service, you know, and those components are not necessarily about the software which you are offering. Like it, they have nothing to do with uh, the broker which you are running, which you are good at. They are about how you can run the broker in an effective way. Like how can you give users capability to monitor it, to uh, to, to make sure it's secure and all that stuff. And the last is basically the biggest challenge I've seen is finding the right people to do this for you. You can find people who are very good at, you know, like broker, or you can find people who are very good at the infrastructure or writing applications on the broker, but the combination is very hard. So you need the combination like who knows the broker really well, plus how to uh, run it in an infrastructure. They also should be able to understand the infrastructure details as well. So that's the biggest challenge. And also the, sometimes the commitment from the, from the company where you guys are working, right, is the company really committed for your service? Is the value right, which you are bringing, to, uh, it's so the, the amount of investment that you need to add all these feature set in your broker is, is basically is the company is committed to do that investment or not? Because these are, ex these are expensive things. Because you need to spend time, energy, and your uh, cycles to develop all of these things. So how to decide? I think it's pretty simple. Unless you have a very specific use case where the feature which you want is not available in the, as, a, as a managed service or the product which you want is not available as the managed service. Uh, so if the product is not available as the managed service, yes, then you have to manage it yourself. Like for example, in our case, RabbitMQ, we're managing ourselves. Uh, but if the feature is not available or the, some sort of configuration is not available, there is one thing I would suggest check your use case as well, because sometimes our use cases are not right. Because our use, most of the use cases are covered by the managed service provider like AWS in this case. So that's what I suggest. So unless it is something very specific, it is not very, uh, it's a good idea to do it yourself. It is always easier and better for you to uh, give it to the managed service provider. Um, so that's, uh, that's about it, I guess. Uh, you are all ready for the replay party now. <laughs> um, so that's our experience at the GE, and I hope you all take away this thing with you that whether you should do it yourself or go with the managed service. Awesome. That was really awesome. Thanks, thanks, Amelia. Really great to hear what GE is up to. Um, they've been a great uh, partner to work with as we've, we've built this service. And uh, as you as well, Odd, uh, great to work with you guys as we built this. And you know, this is just the start. Um, we look forward to continually working with, with all you customers, uh, these customers. Um, we build everything from what customers ask for and what customers need. So we love working with customers and hearing what your needs are. We're gonna continue to enhance and evolve the service. This is just day one, or actually I guess day three of Amazon MQ. Um, we've got lots of plans for the next uh, coming years. 
Uh, as I mentioned, next year we'll be rolling this out globally. You're going to see more integrations with other AWS services and, and making it more integrated with the rest of the platform, which uh, is something we always hear from customers that they love to see. Um, so, so stay tuned and uh, encourage everyone, please go to the, uh, the URL here, check it out, um, read about it. Uh, the documentation's up there. Um, we're going to be publishing some blogs actually over the next coming weeks, uh, some, some cool stuff that some of our solution architects have written. Um, but check it out. Um, go to the console. Literally, you can create a broker in, in about five, ten minutes, and that'll just allow you to just spin it up, give it a, give it a spin. Um, it's free, like I said, to get started. You can try it out. Um, send us your questions. Uh, we've got a developer forum up, so send us your questions. Love to hear from you. Love to hear what you like, what you don't like. Um, we're definitely open to, to hearing from you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, you can uh, also, this, this session is, is recorded, as all the sessions here, you probably know this, but it's going to be recorded. It'll be up on our website, probably on YouTube, so you can share it with your colleagues or, or watch it again. So that's it for today. Thanks very much. Thank you.